I want to announce that the lecture from last Thursday failed to um, have an audio recording, so we could not put it up online. So um, those people who who missed it will have no way to recover it, and so that will be the midterm exam. <laughs> uh, write a commentary on last Thursday's lecture, and we will see how those people who actually come to class uh, how are rewarded in the, uh, in the full scope of things. Uh, hopefully we will uh, get sound recording this time. And I am, you know, the midterm I, I mentioned is still in my head. Uh, hopefully I will uh, assign it before class on Thursday. But I've been thinking about it. I've uh, come up with a whole bunch of questions that I have one by one discarded as being, you know, either too hard or too easy or too much bullshit or, um, you know. But I'll come up with something. Don't worry. <laughs> there will be a midterm, if, if that was a concern anyone had. The chapter we have this week is uh, Land Empires in the Age of Imperialism. Um, it strikes me that the authors who hit on this as a title for a chapter really were desperate. They had no particular reason for covering these topics. And I, I wonder what was going through their heads when they decided that this would be a suitable uh, topic for a chapter. Um, my recollection of it is that we had some sort of concept that uh, we were going to be covering in the subsequent two chapters, seaborne empires, particularly the British, uh, and imperialism in the later part of the 19th century, and that we should give a nod to land empires. And yet, why in the world would we do that? Um, simply to cover territory? Uh, well, yes, to some degree. But picking 1870 as a point of terminus uh, enabled us to avoid issues related to late imperialism in the late 19th century. But it, it has no particular value. And yet, um, the stories that are told in the chapter uh, make a certain kind of sense. The when you look at the non-European um, independent states, the ones that do not uh, become completely dominated by imperialism in the course of the 19th century, you find that there is a revolution in Turkey in 1908. There's a revolution in China in 1911. There's a revolution in Iran in 1906. There's a revolution in Russia in 1905. I'm counting here Russia as a land empire in this sense, because that's how it's covered in the chapter. Um, uh, and so it, it, it might have made sense to go up to the first, uh, the first decade of the, tw of the 20th century and say, isn't the, the long-term takeaway of this uh, of this 19th century uh, discussion of these empires, isn't it the fact that they all run into revolutions? Uh, and the revolutions are um, invariably very messy. So that the Chinese revolution brings the Qing dynasty to an end, but it does not replace it with a coherent government. The Ottoman Empire goes through a revolution that does not produce a very <coughs> effective government, although it's a very enthusiastic and nationalistic one. Uh, 
the constitutional revolution in Iran does not produce a terribly happy result. And of course, the Russian Revolution of 1905 is simply a uh, entering into a waiting period until the big revolution comes in 1918 uh, in the context of World War I. And yet, there does seem to be this odd convergence that you have revolutions at the, uh, at the same time. So if I were rewriting this chapter, um, I might be persuaded by, uh, by these thoughts to extend the time frame of the chapter and say that uh, let us deal with um, ends of empires. You know, what, uh, what is conducive toward the, the end of a, um, uh, of a dynastic uh, regime? Uh, in, at the end of the 19th century instead of stopping around 1870. But there's another perspective that we do fulfill without really making it absolutely clear what we're doing in this chapter. And that would be a competing perspective that has to do with the notion of the modern. Uh, that you look at this period of the early 19th century as uh, the beginnings of the extension of, of modern things outside of the European sphere. But that, of course, is the problem of what is modern. As a specialist on the Middle East, um, and indeed as in that capacity giving a course from time to time on modern Middle Eastern history, uh, I, I'm, I've spent a lot of time pondering this question of why in the world we call uh, Middle Eastern history at any time modern um, and what the modernity of it consists of. Uh, prior to the end of World War II, there were no books written uh, or articles, to the best of my knowledge, that actually used the term modern Middle East because the Middle East really uh, had not taken shape. It was sort of a post-World War I phenomenon with the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire. But you did have books that began to be written using the word modern. Um, and here I'm specifically talking about the Middle East. In 1931, a man named Dodwell wrote a book called The, Founder, uh, the, Father of, Modern, uh, the Founder of Modern Egypt. Uh, about Muhammad Ali, who ruled in the, uh, you know, down to 1839 or so, 1841, in, uh, in the early 19th century. Uh, there was a book written by Brigadier Stephen Longrig, I don't remember the year it was published, called Four Centuries of Modern Iraq. Uh, then there was a book that came out in 1960 that probably was the most um, uh, the, the, the single book that shaped the <coughs> study of the modern Middle East uh, more than any other book. And that was uh, by Bernard Lewis. It was entitled The Emergence of Modern Turkey. Now, um, I remember when the book came out. Uh, I was uh, an undergraduate studying the Middle East, and it was kind of a bombshell book. That now you had a book that actually told you what it was that underlay the modern Middle East. Uh, and you could understand very clearly uh, what, it, uh, what its message was. Uh, at almost exactly the same time, there was another book that came out that covered exactly the same subject matter. Uh, it was called uh, the, uh, the Development of Secularism in Turkey, and it was uh, written by a, um, a Turkish scholar, and people paid very little attention to it. Uh, it was, uh, the, the perception of the modern was seen to be something that was peculiarly adapted to the Western uh, scholarly uh, vision. 
Modern in these books basically means European. It is, um, it is a approach to history that takes European uh, Europeanism or adopt, uh, adoption of European uh, you know, ideas, techniques, uh, and so forth as being the primary um, story that needs to be told because that is the story that introduces what is modern. In this story, you have uh, Muhammad Ali in Egypt um, coming in in the aftermath of the French withdrawal uh, after Napoleon's invasion of 1798 and building up a very powerful Egyptian state uh, that had uh, very strong European influences in the construction of the military so that Muhammad Ali created schools for training military officers in uh, Western style uh, military techniques um, and he began a program of sending selected um, young officers to France in particular to study there and uh, come back and be um, uh, be prepared to teach in these schools or to uh, you know, advance you know, Western learning in Egypt in some other respect. Uh, he introduced a printing press and started printing a government gazette that was uh, analogous to uh, what you would have in certain European countries. Uh, and he introduced um, an economic system that would pay for all of this, uh, which was basically a monopsonist system by which the, uh, the Egyptian government became uh, the only buyer of things. Uh, you could grow wheat, but you, could, but you had to sell it to the government. Uh, and wheat was the main, uh, the main product of Egypt at that time. And so the government would, would set the price for purchasing wheat, would purchase the wheat, and then it would sell it at a greatly inflated price on the international market, which was starved for wheat because of the Napoleonic Wars that had uh, not only reduced grain production in Europe, but had um, limited uh, imports into Europe in the, uh, the continental system that the British used to try to curtail uh, you know, the French war effort. Uh, so Muhammad Ali was, uh, this was, he set up a series of monopoly, or we call them monopolies, or absolutely monopsonies, as I said, um, in which uh, the state becomes the buyer of the agricultural uh, products of Egypt. It sells them at a uh, higher price, uses the proceeds to set up a larger military uh, to build factories, to produce military goods, uniforms, weapons, etc. Uh, sets up schools to train the military in Western techniques, and ultimately uh, goes conquering. And so Egypt conquers Syria, uh, and eventually goes beyond and appears to be on the verge of conquering the Ottoman Empire, that is say of taking Istanbul until the Europeans intervene and bring this to an end. At the end of the 1830s, uh, the Egyptians are forced to go back to Egypt. Uh, the monopsonies are dissolved. There's a limit placed on the size of the Egyptian army. And the whole Muhammad Ali ep episode comes to an end, although his uh, family continues to rule in Egypt down until 1952. Okay, that was, uh, that was modern Egypt. And modern Egypt, uh, or that was the beginning of modern Egypt, the foundation of modern Egypt. Modern Egypt being defined in this sense 
as the adoption of specific um, European uh, practices, uh, including uh, European teachers to come in and teach at the, at the new schools. Um, the schools were military schools, but they covered subjects that were fairly broad. For example, you have a music school established in Egypt, then later one in Istanbul, so that people will learn, uh, presumably, a military music. Uh, you have music in Muslim armies going back hundreds of years before this. Uh, if you ever listen to uh, the Turkish March by Mozart or certain passages in Abduction from the Seraglio, you'll hear how Mozart imitates the sound of an Ottoman army. You know, it kind of blaring and not very sophisticated, whereas uh, now they wanted to have music that would sound sound European. Exactly why is never precisely explained. Although there is this an interesting anecdote by a Hungarian traveler who, um, uh, was a Hungarian Jew converted to Catholicism and then traveled through the, the Middle East um, pretending that he was a Sufi uh, sheikh. And so he would go to places dressed up as a local holy man and um, uh, deceive the, the locals. This is something that the Europeans just really got off on. You know, let's go and deceive the locals into thinking that we're holy men. And um, at one point he found himself in Afghanistan and a small contingent of British soldiers marched by because uh, Britain was competing with Russia to have influence in Afghanistan. And after they went by, uh, a man came up and tapped him on the shoulder and said that the emir wanted to see him. So he went off to see the ruler, the governor of the city of Herat. And the governor said, um, uh, you're a European pretending to be a Sufi sheikh and traveling through my domains, aren't you? And Arminius Vanbury, the traveler said, you know, yes, I am. You, know, you, you got me. What tipped you off? And he said, it was reported that you tapped your foot when the British uh, went by. And uh, no Muslim would tap his foot to, uh, to military music. So it may be that the answer to the music coming into Ottoman and Egyptian military affairs has something to do with arranging large military movements in which you use uh, drums to, and marching in step in order to perform uh, military maneuvers. Uh, I really don't know. I've never found a history strictly of the music school. But it was one of those things that, that fit the notion of a, uh, of a European innovation. Now, and that's fine. Uh, the, this, it, it's, it's all, uh, it all sounds good. Muhammad Ali was a powerful figure. He had a powerful army. He did some conquering. He ultimately uh, lost. Uh, but, his, but he installed his family uh, in power. They later became uh, declared kings of Egypt after World War I. Um, but there's a question as whether this is the most important thing happening in Egypt at this time. And or is this, uh, is this a selectivity that is um, bent toward a presumed importance of Europeanization over anything else? I'll just mention two things that happened in Egypt at this time that, uh, that might point in a different direction. Um, one of them was, uh, and both of them have to do with religion. Uh, first of them has to do with the uh, with the uh, the donations that people made as trusts for pi pious purposes or maintenance of their family. The word is a waqf. 
plural is uh, Alkaf in Turkish. The Ottoman form would be uh, Vakuf and uh, Evkaf. Um, these uh, trusts took up an enormous amount of the wealth, the productive wealth of Middle Eastern countries. Um, a study, for example, in the large Syrian city of Aleppo uh, around 1800 showed, for example, that every single shop in the covered bazaar in Aleppo was owned by a waqf. Uh, there was no longer any private ownership because people who had once owned these shops had donated the shops uh, in perpetuity as a trust so that the income from the shops, that is to say the rents received by the uh, trustee of the waqf would be devoted to the purposes that were designated by the, by the muwakkaf, by the person who established the trust. And this was supposed to be in perpetuity so that since the, uh, the principle of a waqf came from income producing property or an income producing entity, it meant that you were taking uh, real estate, particularly urban real estate, but also rural real estate, you're taking out of circulation and you were shifting it to a uh, to a uh, monetary regime where it could never be sold, you know, forever. Um, and gradually more and more property was coming under walk, which of course meant a stronger and stronger limitation on what uh, revenues the government could collect um, because this land was no longer um, Know, paying taxes, his income was being paid uh, for, uh, for these benevolent purposes. The nature of the benevolence uh, would vary. Uh, it's been argued, I think, pretty soundly that most public services and social services that we think of today as being the purview of government in its, let's say, in its non-libertarian uh, mode, um, that most of those uh, services and, uh, and functions were being fulfilled by, uh, by the al so that um, if you had a hospital, the hospital would be supported by, uh, by a waqf. Um, if you had a school, it would be supported by a waqf. Uh, and if you had a fountain for people to have clean drinking water, be supported by a lot. This, uh, this analysis is a little bit illusory because careful studies of Alkoff that have been done recently show that you have a great variability from one city to another as to the purposes for which Alkoff were, were used. Uh, in one city in Palestine, for example, 90% of the al were used uh, for the support of the descendants of the donor so that you would have a, um, the, uh, the rents would be collected and then paid out to all of the living descendants of the donor with there being some sort of other pious purpose uh, beyond that. Uh, but only after the family died out. Uh, in another city of the same size at the same time in Lebanon, 90% of the al were used for, for public uh, benefits, not for, uh, for private maintenance of families. So we, it, it's a somewhat murky subject that hasn't been thoroughly studied yet, but certainly it was a very important part of the, um, of the, uh, of the economy. And the notion of it really continues uh, down to the present day to some extent. So that uh, one of the biggest universities in Turkey is Bill Kent University, which is not very old. It was established, what, 20 years ago, something like that. But it is supported by 40 corporations, 
uh, all of whose profits go to, uh, go to the university. But the university is prohibited from buying any goods from any of the corporations. Um, essentially, this is a, a huge walk where the corporations are obligated, some of them are very large corporations, obligated to transfer all of their profits to the, uh, um, you know, to the university. So Bill Candidate University being a very, becomes a very large and very wealthy university, um, not because there is one philanthropist, there's one entrepreneur who puts it all together, uh, but it isn't like Stanford or something where you have one, one person who says this will be my legacy, but rather it's set up as a, uh, as a public benefit supported by this. All right, why am I talking about the al -Qaf? Because Muhammad Ali abolished them. Um, he uh, made the argument, or his, his thinkers made the argument, that during the three-year period of the French occupation of Egypt, um, the land of Egypt had passed out of the realm of Islam, the Dar al-Islam, and to become part of the realm of war, the Dar al-Harb. And that by, by ceasing to be part of the land of Islam, those things that were predicated on Islamic law, namely the al -Qaf, uh, had all um, had all been dissolved, just ipso facto. Now, once the French took over, uh, the walks. Uh, now, the French did nothing to the Al-Qaf. Uh, they didn't abolish them. But Muhammad Ali said they are, they ipso facto be, uh, lapsed because this ceased to be Muslim land. And therefore, this is unoccupied property, and, they will, and so he seized it for the government. Which meant that he took over um, uh, those things that were paid for the, by the Al-Qaf such as the upkeep of mosques, schools, payment of salaries of religious officials and so forth. But now he had control of the income and he could pay whatever he wanted uh, for these services or functions or he could minimize them and keep as much of the revenue as he wished uh, for his own purposes. Uh, so this, was, along with his monopsonist um, policies, was a way of funneling revenue into the government so that he could do these, these other things. But of course it had a profoundly destabilizing effect upon the religious community in Egypt. Because here you had uh, individuals and families that had uh, oriented themselves around uh, public benefits and, and it had disappeared. It later on reappears. So you have down to, uh, say, down to recent decades, you have private mosques being created in Egypt. Again, I mean, it's uh, once it goes back into the Islamic realm, then the, the waqf uh, once again uh, comes into being. But, but it was an example of the government uh, eradicating one of the fundamental uh, building blocks of religious society in Egypt. The second thing that he did that doesn't get talked about what went along similar lines. Ever since um, 1300 or so, uh, Muslim society had been uh, increasingly dominated by Sufi brotherhoods. And Sufi brotherhoods spread from uh, Morocco to Indonesia. Uh, they were highly diverse um, and they did not recognize national boundaries. So that you could have a uh, Sufi Brotherhood in Morocco that would be, uh, that would think of itself as being a chapter of a Sufi Brotherhood that had other chapters in um, in Egypt or Afghanistan or India or Indonesia. Uh, prior to 1300, Islam was never really organized in a spatial sense. You didn't have member organizations. The Sufi Brotherhoods were very specifically and explicitly 
membership organizations. And as such, even though they were not um, uh, formally competitive, uh, they were situationally competitive because you had thousands of these brotherhoods uh, in 1800, the beginning of the 19th century, and they were looking for adherents. And if you became an adherent, it meant that you were going to follow the rule established by the, um, you know, the sheikh of that brotherhood, and that rule would, uh, would compel you to do certain things in a ritual manner or to live in a certain way. In some cases, it would compel you to give money to the, uh, to the sheikh. Um, uh, enormous amount of variety in this. Uh, you know, most of the Senegalese taxi drivers in New York belong to a Sufi brotherhood in which they funnel money to the sheikh of the, of the brotherhood. And not so much the taxi drivers as the people who sell you know, knock off uh, Rolex watches on, you know, Fifth Avenue and so on. Um, they belong to the Muridia Brotherhood and they come over here on a tourist visa, um, live in sort of a group home with other Muridis for three months until their tourist visa expires and they're peddlers and then they go back to Senegal and then they're replaced by others. The Muridia is one of the two great Sufi brotherhoods of Senegal. So uh, these were not trivial. They were profoundly important for the society. And in a number of places, they are the cutting edge of opposition to imperialism. Uh, this takes place in Somalia, it takes place in Afghanistan, or in uh, um, Algeria, in Morocco, in um, Sudan, uh, and you think, well, that's sort of a quaint 19th century thing, but a number of the Mujahideen groups who fought against Russia uh, or the Soviet Union in Afghanistan uh, in the 1980s uh, were um, based on Sufi brotherhoods uh, because they truly do engage uh, uh, Muslims in their activities at a very profound level. So what Muhammad Ali tried to do was to regulate them. And he said, well, we'll divide Egypt into districts. And in this district, uh, Brotherhood A can, can uh, seek adherence, but it cannot seek adherence in District B because that will be uh, the territory of another Brotherhood. Um, this effort to, uh, to control the Brotherhoods is parallel to the effort to control the, uh, the Al-Qaf. And somewhat later in the century, we'll see a parallel effort to, uh, to control the, uh, the artisan guilds. And what this really amounted, and, and even beyond that, to reorganize the spatial life of people in these countries, Muslim countries. Um, what it amounted to was a century long or a century and a half long process of um, deinstitutionalizing the religious aspects of society that had been dominant for uh, pretty much ever since the, uh, the end of the Mongol phase of Middle Eastern history in uh, 1335. Um, This was something that the Europeans sort of knew vaguely. They didn't follow it. Uh, the French may have followed it more because after they conquered Algeria in 1840, they, um, they uh, had some scholars who were assigned to make a, basically an, encyclo an encyclopedia of all the Sufi brotherhoods. But, um, after they had defeated their main opponent, they, um, uh, who had a Sufi background, they were able to proceed without formally disestablishing the brotherhoods, except most of the Algerian brotherhoods uh, disappear in the course of the 19th century. So from one point of view, you can say this is a period of Europeanization. Uh, 
from another point of view, you could say this is a, this is a period where uh, de-Islamicization occurs. The populations remain Muslim, but the institutional structure of the, uh, of the society, uh, to the degree that that structure is predicated on Islamic um, uh, practices, uh, is increasingly eroded uh, by the government. The Ottoman Empire follows in the same, uh, the same path, starting in 1829, and there the, the process is called the Tanzimat, or the reorganization. Uh, Bernard Lewis, in his book on the emergence of modern Turkey, really says this is what we should be studying, is the Tanzimat, because under the Tanzimat you had the adoption of European military practices, you had the establishment of military schools, you had uh, instructors brought in from Europe to teach in the schools, you had Ottoman officers who were sent to Europe to learn European ways, um, and it, going farther than whatever happened in Egypt, you had not in uh, 1829 when the Tanzimat begins, but in 1836, uh, I'm sorry, 1821, then 1836, and 18, uh, 1839, and 1856, that you gradually have a installation of European views at an ideological level, so that um, the beginning of the Tanzimat uh, portrays the actions of the uh, Sultan as being within the framework and the, uh, the leeway given to Sultans within Islam. By the time you get to 1856, declarations of equality of all religions uh, and so forth, um, that appear to be very European in inspiration become the hallmark of the Tanzimat. Um, the Ottoman government establishes secular schools that are designed to feed into the military uh, schools, the war college in Istanbul. Um, so you have military high schools in different parts of the empire. Um, you have a um, increasing involvement of the legal system with European law codes taking the form of adopting almost without change aspects of European codified law uh, that particularly from Belgium uh, that will cover certain areas of litigation so you adopt a commercial code uh, a criminal code and so forth until Islamic law becomes increasingly relegated to a uh, minor uh, role concentrated primarily on personal status and family law and inheritance. Uh, and most other areas of law uh, are codified in European form. The uh, The result of this is that the number of jobs available for religiously trained people diminishes because you have, um, in the legal system, you now need people who are trained in Western concepts of law. Um, and gradually, the number of positions in the educational system diminishes. Uh, and by the late part of the century, you're having the al Qaf, the Evkaf. Uh, taken under government uh, control and the revenues distributed by the government rather than by the individual um, uh, trustees who uh, had always been the administrators of the, uh, of the al Qaf system. So the Ottoman government um, moves in the same direction as the, uh, as the Egyptian government. They do not, uh, they're a little hesitant to 
move against the Sufi brotherhoods. That doesn't take place until, uh, until after World War I when the Sufi brotherhoods are formally abolished. Uh, but uh, the brotherhood that was most strongly associated with the Janissary Corps, uh, which was seen as a, uh, a military unit of profound corruption and waste, uh, that, that brotherhood uh, is abolished. That's the Bektashi Brotherhood. Now, abolishing it doesn't mean it disappears. Uh, we always say that it was abolished until there are no more Bektashis. In fact, the Bektashis are alive and well in Albania, um, where they survived not only from the Ottoman period, but the communist regime. You still have Bektashis around. Similarly, efforts to abolish the Sufi Brotherhoods um, in the 1920s uh, really failed, uh, failed to do so. Um, but the point was that the, the government was moving against those institutional uh, forms that were uh, most strongly related to, the, uh, to having Islam be at the uh, foundation of the society. Um, most of these uh, aspects of the Tanzimat era are not discussed by Bernard Lewis or the uh, other people who've written on Turkey in this period. They're more discussed now than they were in, say, in the 1960s. Um, because that, I think they, scholars saw it as being sort of beside the point. The point was that uh, the good things from Europe, like you know, modern weapons, conscription, um, good artillery, you know, the good things from Europe were coming in, including uh, law and ultimately constitutionalism. And that's the story. It's the story of the, the good European stuff uh, entering into the society. And if that had a counterpart of the, uh, of the institutional structure of the, uh, of the society based on Islam, with where either withering away or being uh, destroyed, you know, uh, in a very purposeful fashion. That wasn't, that, that was okay. That, that was collateral damage. You know, nobody wanted Islam around anyway if they were Europeans. And so it didn't become a subject of, of discussion. Um, now, I'd argue that this is. Uh, that this was a big mistake, and that the Europeanization, uh, to the degree that it was supposed to create powerful armies, constitutional government, uh, elections, liberté, égalité, fraternité, etc., it really didn't do it. You know, you come down to the 20th century and you say, did the Islamic uh, empires of the early 19th century uh, Europeanized to the extent that they became as powerful as the European powers and as well accepted and as committed to the, uh, uh, to the modern institutional forms of government and society in Europe. And the answer is clearly no. Uh, they did not become sufficiently powerful militarily to, to win a war against uh, against the European power. Um, they did not develop constitutions that were very effective. Uh, they were so fragile that they were easily taken over by dictatorships in the 20th century. And so here you have a story <coughs> that we take to be the main story, and it's a story that sort of uh, withers away. Um, the outcome, you know, you have all this effort that we're told about, that's put into creating a new way of doing things, a, a European fashion that does not produce uh, a European style uh, society or European style institutions. It produces um, sort of uh, tepid imitations of them that are pretty much easily, uh, easily overcome. On the other hand, the concurrent efforts to, uh, to de-Islamicize the 
the lands and to undermine or eradicate the institutions uh, of religious uh, inspiration that had been the primary structuring elements of society for several hundred years. That was remarkably successful. Not done, not totally successful. But it by and large worked so that the Sufi brotherhoods, um, they don't disappear, but they become vastly diminished. The religious educational system does not disappear, but it becomes vastly diminished. Islamic law does not disappear, but it is curtailed uh, to a very, very extensive degree by uh, the new law codes. Uh, the guild system that had been the primary structure of buying and selling and producing goods for, let's say, from the 14th century onward, uh, the guild system disappears uh, almost everywhere. Um, and then you had uh, uh, urban renewal. And the urban renewal, which became an important aspect of, um, of, of change, uh, particularly in Cairo and Istanbul, the sort of capital cities, the urban renewal would take the form of uh, building long straight streets that carriages could go on uh, without paying a whole lot of attention to what else was there. Um, these visions of having a uh, Parisian-like houseminized um, uh, capital uh, were very intoxicating for uh, for rulers and city planners, but they didn't take into account the way the, the population actually actually lived. And in some places, uh, many places, you can see the ways in which uh, the urban uh, changing uh, the urban fabric uh, destroys the underlying structure of the society. Uh, if you compare, let us say, um, the French did a little differently uh, in North Africa. They would have a, an old city with a wall around it and all of the attributes of a uh, traditional Islamic city. And then they would build a parallel city outside the walls. So you had Fez in Morocco, and then you had Fez Jadid, new Fez, outside the walls. That would be the modern city. And the result is that in North Africa, you still have um, urban structures that, uh, that go back to the, uh, you know, the period from before uh, the French invasion in 1840 in, in Algeria because uh, they built a parallel city instead of destroying the old one. In other places, however, the idea was that you eradicate the old. In the city that I uh, know best, um, provincial city in Iran called Nishapur, uh, you can see very clearly um, the it happens later in Iran for reasons I'll talk about at another point. But there, when the urban changes came, uh, the Shah of Iran was entranced by the idea of traffic circles or roundabouts. And so you would take a, uh, almost every Iranian city of any size had a, had two broad boulevards, or broad streets, uh, cut through the city. Let's say, you know, here's the wall of the city. The wall gets turned out. You get uh, two streets. Um, very commonly, they'll simply be called cement three, 30-meter uh, streets, uh, because they're very wide. And uh, then when you get outside the wall, goes on. you have a traffic circle there, traffic circle here. But in Nijapur, um, this ended at the railroad station, but up here it simply ended in dirt. Uh, 
the, the, the streets weren't designed to go any place. They were paved in here, in the center of the town, but they were dirt, they were gravel as soon as you got past the traffic circle because they weren't conceived of in terms of the circulation of traffic. They're conceived of in terms of a modern uh, uh, project that seemed to have a European inspiration. So what would happen is that uh, the government buildings and the banks and the, the new important new structures were built here in the, uh, in the center where you know, State Street crossed Main Street. Um, but if you looked at the old bazaar, the covered bazaar, ran down that way. And it was uh, cut in half by the new boulevard. And gradually it disappeared. And this would happen in place after place after place. Uh, this, this deliberate destruction of the structure of residence and the uh, distribution of business and so forth, uh, it was not simply a, a European obsession, but it was a conscious effort to shift the, uh, the governance of society into the hands of the government and out of the traditional forms that would be associated, say, with the guilds. Uh, say, in a bazaar, you'd have the, um, say, the, the, the copper smiths would be here and the uh, rope uh, people would be here and the shoe sellers, the cobblers would be up here. Each guild had a section in the, uh, uh, in the covered bazaar. But now you would have modern shoe stores and you know, utility stores along these main streets. Uh, the, the effort to undermine the existing society is, is somewhat obscure because when we look at the, at the adoption of law codes and schools and military reforms and ultimately things like constitutions uh, and um, uh, elections, we think of it as being this is conscious Europeanization that we can identify as Europeanization. But these other things that have to do with, uh, with undermining the system of trusts, undermining the Sufi brotherhoods, undermining the guild, undermining the, uh, the employment uh, potential for people trained in religious schools, and finally in undermining the, um, the built uh, structure of the community. These things are not manifestly Europeanizing. Europeans were happy to see them happen, but they didn't, really the Europeans I don't think knew enough about the society to have thought of these things. These were more or less the local ideas rather than ones that came in from Europe. And yet these probably had more to, in my view, I shouldn't say probably because well, people may well disagree with me, but in my view, uh, these have more to do with the structuring of something like a modern, uh, a modern state and society than do the superficial and uh, indifferently uh, effective um, uh, import of specific European techniques and institutions. So if you look at it from this perspective, then the story becomes not modernization in the sense of adopting what is European, but rather some kind of internal uh, concept of uh, quite, uh, quite uh, unexpressed in uh, literary terms, uh, some internal concept of changing the society in a fashion that will um, benefit uh, the the ruling establishment. Why would they do that? 
if you look at the broad uh, political structure of Islamic society, uh, you find that for um, particularly the period after 1300, that there is a uneasy relationship between religion and the state. The, um, the basic theory of Islamic law uh, maintains that anarchy is, uh, is the worst thing that can occur. And anarchy, by their definition, is sort of that they're talking about, say, Lebanon during the Civil War from you know, 1975 to uh, 1990, uh, where it's kind of a war of many factions against each other and no one having a chance to win. Uh, all the theorists were opposed to anarchy. And they, they declared that uh, the state was necessary. And they even went so far, particularly in the context of the Mongols, but later as well in the context of imperialist rule, they went so far as to say that um, the state should not be uh, resisted or rebelled against so long as it maintains uh, Islamic law or some vestiges of Islamic law or even one aspect of Islamic law. Uh, if the state is recognizing of Islam, uh, then it should not be it should not be opposed. Why was Islamic law the center? Because in theory, the tenant, the, there was a unan unanimous agreement, kind of a Hobbesian view, that um, uh, the state uh, moves toward tyranny by its own nature. This is the nature of monarchy uh, or of really of any state, that if they are not checked, the people who control the state will, uh, will tend to become tyrants. Um, this is very much in accord with uh, European uh, political thought, and European th political thought then evolves notions that the way you check the move toward tyranny is by having uh, popular institutions like parliaments, uh, you know, taxation that cannot be levied without permission of parliament, so forth and so on. And this, uh, these regimes are accomplished uh, through revolution or through uh, the sorts of pressures and threats of revolution. And so you get the idea in the West that uh, between anarchy and tyranny, what keeps government in line is uh, the vox populi, the voice of the people, uh, expressed in some fashion or other but particularly in relation to, uh, to money, to, you know, if you can starve the beast, to use the current phrase, take away the money from the government, you will reduce the tyranny of the government. And we're hearing a great deal about that uh, these days. This is uh, the tradition in Western political thought. Now, in the Islamic world, uh, the idea was that what prevents uh, the state from becoming tyrannical is Islamic law, and that the key word is that the key uh, aspect of this is not control of money, but rather the control of justice. So the um, when you have uh, movements in Europe they tend to focus on the word freedom. And in the 19th century at least, 18th century before that, movements would tend to fo focus on the word justice. This is what everybody aspired to. Justice was thought of as being what was offered to society by Islamic law. Um, so the uh, the states uh, had Islamic law courts. Um, the law courts did not have um, penal jurisdiction. In other words, if you had a conviction, uh, the, the condemned person, um, whether it was to prison or death or whatever, was turned over to the civil arm of the government for the execution of sentence. Uh, the judges themselves did not have an executioner at their bidding. 
nevertheless, um, uh, the judges had a very large population of advisors, of people who were specialists on the law, who would advise them as to what was just in a particular situation, or they would advise litigants. So a litigant would, uh, you did not have any lawyers in the, in the court, but a litigant could go to a juris counsel and ask him for, a, for an opinion that would um, support his side of a case. This opinion was called a fetwa. Uh, the person who, giving, who was giving it either had the office of or was performing in the function of a mufti, meaning one who gives a fetwa. All right. Um, each litigant could bring in as many fetwas as they wanted. And if the judge was uncertain about how to understand the law, the judge could get his own juris consult. Um, and the fetwas were basically like, uh, like legal rules where you would cite precedent. Matter of fact, the Sharia uh, in operation in those, uh, in those centuries was uh, closer to English common law than anything else because it was heavily based on precedent. And the scholar was the person, like the modern lawyer, who had the ability to go into the established literature, find the precedents, bring them to bear on the case at hand. Um, this legal uh, apparatus was supported in part by uh, the government's uh, financing of religious schools. But in almost every community, you had many of these jurists who were locally educated and who were part of important families and who were not um, employees of the government. They were simply the, the in the community, like professors are today. Um, people you could go to and expect a good, fair uh, appraisal of of a, of a situation. And we certainly know that people would shop around for fetwas. Uh, say, you know, you, you don't like my opinion, well, I'll go to someone else and get a better opinion from him. Because the fetwa is never binding. It's become binding now in Saudi Arabia, but normally a fetwa is not binding. It is simply an opinion. Um, so the theory was that um, the ruler who is simply another Muslim, as much bound by Islamic law as any subject in his realm, that the ruler um, could be uh, challenged uh, by the legal system. The legal system could simply declare that his actions were unjust, uh, wrong, um, and in extreme instances, uh, say that it was warranted to, to overthrow him. It rarely happened, but did occasionally happen. Um, because the legal system, even though it consisted of state appointees who were the judges, and in some cases the muftis, uh, it, it depended upon the notion that the Islamic law evolves independently of government through the, uh, through the collectivity of the scholars and the schools that the scholars attend, which are schools that are financed by the al Qaf, which are funds given to the support of the schools by private Muslim citizens. In other words, the whole apparatus of law is in government, but is staffed by a mass of people who are only partially uh, within the government. Um, when it came to sanctioning um, the ruler, it, it didn't happen very often. Um, in uh, you know, you, one comparison you might make is with the Confucian system, where a Confucian uh, sage or, or scholar who was working in the ministry under an emperor. Um, Confucian philosophy maintained that if he, came, if he concluded that the emperor was doing something that was wrong, that was criminal or, uh, you know, 
uh, vice-ridden or something like that, it was, or corrupt. It was the duty of the Confucian gentleman to remonstrate, to go to the emperor and say, what you are doing is wrong. But that did not mean that he could call on people to overthrow the emperor. What he was supposed to do was to remonstrate, and if the emperor did not change his practice, he was supposed to resign. And we have many examples of this uh, happening in, in Confucian society. But because you still, but there the, the, the credentialing of uh, religious scholars was much more a government project than it was in the Islamic world because they had an exam system. Um, so what you had was the idea that Islamic law would be just. Uh, studies that have been done in recent uh, decades working at the detailed level of how courts operated indicate that by and large um, the Muslim courts were seen to be just by the population. So that when you had Muslims in lawsuits with non-Muslims there was no presumption in favor of the Muslim. That the non-Muslim would win uh, proportionally as much as the Muslim or when you had a lawsuit between a government official and an ordinary citizen, there was no presumption that the government official was right. You would have um, as many uh, victories for one side as for the other. So as far as we can tell, people thought that their legal system was just, um, and that the legal system was where uh, tyranny would be prevented. Doesn't mean that the uh, Sultan couldn't cut the head off of his favorite wife and, you know, throw the body in the Bosphorus. Um, uh, but if he did so, it did not undermine the legal system. For example, if, if well, let's take a ridiculous example. If you had an American president who got a blowjob from an assistant in a, in a closet off of his office, would that undermine our legal system? No, it would disgrace the president, or in some people's eyes, uh, maybe you know, make him seem like a good fellow, but, um, but it wouldn't affect the whole system. So what we've done very often in looking at oriental despotism is to focus on the, the atrocities performed by rulers without recognizing that most people thought they were living in a pretty just society, and you know, if you're gonna play with the rulers, you deserve what you get anyway. But, uh, okay, the, the people who were ruling in the 19th century recognized that there was this long tradition that would curtail a move toward tyranny because people would have an atavistic sense that religion should prevent tyranny. What happened in, in the early 19th century, uh, I'm convinced, is that um, the experience of the French Revolution and Napoleon, and perhaps you could throw in some other exemplars here, convinced people that it was possible to be absolutely tyrannical, that you could actually control religion. Because that's what Napoleon did. This whole business of um, having reaching a concordat with the Pope, reaching an agreement with the Jews, um, making everyone a co-equal citizen and removing religion from the, uh, from the core enterprise of the state. Uh, in Europe, this in certain ways, but in the, in the Islamic world, it was sort of a paradise. If we could just get rid of all of these religious scholars, think what we could do. And that is what Muhammad Ali did. That is what the Ottoman sultans did in the Tanzimat. They, I think they took, uh, they saw Europe as a nearby example of uh, the possibility of bringing religion under control. And they, so they thought, what are the main pillars of a religious society? The Sufi Brotherhoods, al Kaf the uh, legal system, the educational system, the guilds, these urban structure, uh, let's simply change all those. And 
if we change all those, what will we get? Uh, we will get um, perfection. We will have perfect tyrannies. So when you take the, the modernization theory that starts from the idea that you're borrowing European goods, techniques, um, personnel, this and that, you're borrowing European goods in order to, to get to, to European perfections, democracy, constitution, uh, this and that. Um, then then you, you, you find that you, you play out the string to the end of the century and none of it worked. These places did not become uh, European liberal societies with uh, democratic and economically uh, dynamic cultures. But if you take it from the point of view of, of what I think is the, uh, the other story, that is to say the undermining of the foundations of religious society, and you say, what should be the outcome of that? What you should find is that at the end of the story, what you have is, is absolute tyranny. That worked. That's what we got. That's what we got in Turkey under Ataturk in a fairly benign way. And after the World War II, that's what we got in a whole series of military dictatorships that have only now uh, uh, come under threat. So I think that the, the narrative that we were encouraged to follow uh, in the 1960s and have been following ever since that said that the purpose of borrowing from the West is to become Western is, it's not wrong, but it doesn't lead to the outcomes. Uh, it only leads to a sense that, well, I guess it failed. I guess something went wrong. It didn't happen. But if you look at the counter narrative, which is that, um, that uh, perhaps with European inspiration, uh, the states that were formed simultaneously uh, taking other steps that the Europeans weren't even particularly aware of to undermine the foundations of their own, uh, of their own societies in the, to the extent that those foundations were predicated on, on long Islamic uh, practices. Uh, that worked from the point of view of rulers. That came to precisely the end that uh, that, the, that the theorists have predicted. If you remove Islamic law and the independent guardians of Islamic law from a position of influence in the society, because these scholars were uh, involved with the Sufi Brotherhoods, they're involved with the guilds, they're involved at every level of society. If you remove them, uh, what you should get is uh, a free track to become tyrannical. So they remove them, and that's, uh, that's what they got. So in, in some respects, what the, was happening in the, uh, in the Islamic land em empires in the era of imperialism was a profound transformation, but it wasn't the transformation that we wrote about in this chapter. Um, now you'd think somebody must have screwed up. Well. I wrote the chapter, um, or at least I didn't. I wasn't the, the first author in the chapter. I inherited the chapter from another author, and now I think it has to be uh, reconsidered. The problem is that in in world history, uh, I've talked before about this issue of canonization. If it is assumed by all of the major uh, narratives that we have of world history that the proper narrative is the one of Europeanization, um, then what is the cost of, um, of going against that and coming up with another uh, counter narrative? And by the cost, I mean uh, things like loss of market share and diminution of my annual income. So it has to be done carefully, it has to be done with uh, circumspection, but I think that we can come up I can come up with a, uh, a better story than the one that we currently have in this chapter. On Thursday, I'm going to talk uh, somewhat about the Chinese side of things.
and um, uh, probably not talk much about Russia. Uh, but you'll read about that in the chapter.